Hello, I'm Brigante of Blackbird of Blackbird's Brew. Welcome to the first installment of the new series, Local Pagan. Recently, I was meditating on the fact that technology has really changed the game when it comes to spirituality. Our ancestors, they just, they lived where they lived and their traditions were rooted in the soil they stood upon. And what they knew of spiritual matters was largely a matter of what they had been taught by their parents and the resident spiritual leaders or the wise men and women of their local village, which is a far cry from the modern reality what, in which all manner of information is literally at our fingertips. We are not dependent on the oral tradition. We have books, articles, videos that are explaining these ancient things and these ideas and practices from a variety of points of views. We even have a pagan history being studied by professional archaeologists and anthropologists. And then there are linguistic experts that are enlightening us more and more about ancient languages. And then they go on to provide us with more nuanced interpretations of our surviving stories. We can learn about all these things from the comfort of our own homes that are continents, oceans, and thousands of years away from the sources. Truly, we are in an age of richness, and this would have seemed absolutely impossible to our ancestors who would never have dreamed of comparing their customs to someone half a world away and trying to find if there's any connectivity between the two. Uh, but what we sometimes struggle with, particularly us American pagans, I think, is learning how to become rooted. The United States is a young country, but Nevertheless, we do have native tribes whose families immigrated here many thousands of years ago. And then on the European things, there are families that have been here for 400 and in some cases even 500 years. That's quite a while. It's long enough for us to have no excuse for not having done a better job of blending cultures to forge something uniquely American, including spirituality. American paganism is not going to develop along the exact same lines as our homeland countries of, that were ancestral lands, you know, oceans away. Uh, but what we can do is allow ourselves to be affected by the energies of the land we actually live on. Yes, we have imported our gods, and yes, we can feel their presence here, but we also have the energies of the lands we're actually on, and those energies with our gods and our ancestors that have been here, and the ancestors we are still connected to in foreign lands. I mean, this is all interacting together at all times. And this doesn't mean that we have to disassociate ourselves from our ancestors or the lands where, they're, where they lived, but we do have to square with the reality uh, that most of us are an ocean away from those places, and we may never get to see them with our own eyes. So we need to put down roots where we are. We need to place emphasis where we are and begin establishing traditions and allowing those traditions to reflect the realities of where we live. It's how our ancestors did it, and I think it's a good place for us to start. So the first steps that I'm taking in this direction is to pay greater attention to what's going on in the natural world around me. And trying to, instead of trying to impose my perceptions of what ought to be, acknowledge what is and adapt accordingly. And yes, I know that's rich coming from me as much as I have complained about Missouri weather on this channel. But keep in mind, a considerable amount of my DNA did originate in the British Isles and complaining about the weather is a national pastime of British culture. Uh, that particular route runs exceedingly deep. It goes all the way through the ocean into the fair British Islands and back into me. And, and honestly, Missouri weather is forever inspiring comments just for its oddities and its most impolite timing of major weather events. Uh, but moving on, 
Uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation updates things to look for each month on its website. So I decided to check it out the other day. And here's what I found. It was just four things that they said to really keep your eyes peeled for. One was a species of butterfly called cloudless sulfurs that's migrating south right now. Uh, their wings are kind of a buttery yellow, so I'm keeping my eyes peeled for those. I rather like butterflies. Uh, butterflies symbolize radical transformation. And with them flying south for the winter, that reinforces the idea that we're switching from a time of great growth and change into a time of dormancy as we are going from summer to autumn and then into winter. And this led me to thinking about how butterflies move. The way they fly through the air, it's just so soft, just less than a whisper. You know, they don't cut their way through the air. They just kind of float and drift and they go on their way. And that demonstrates how it's possible to move vast distances without being extremely forceful. And I think there's a lesson there. And then the color on the butterfly wings reminds me of fading sunlight. Even on a sunny day, I'm noticing that the light doesn't have quite the same force and brutality as it did just a month ago. And the days are growing noticeably shorter, which makes me very happy. <laughs> Uh, the next thing they said to look for is that uh, Missouri does have four types of sumac. Um, it's growing natively and their leaves are turning bright red right now. And I cannot tell you what a visual antidote these red leaves are. I've actually seen a few already turn. Uh, now our trees, they tend to kind of drag their feet before changing their leaves. They do so almost as if they're doing us a profound favor that they consider to be a great inconvenience. Uh, but, and the truth is that by the time we get down to September, I'm beyond done with the color green. I'm fed up with the attitude of the trees. So seeing the changing leaves of the sumac is actually very, very welcome. And red is also my favorite color, although it is a color that has to be handled judiciously. It can easily inspire feelings of aggression and hostility, be a warning of danger or an order to just stop right there, like it is with traffic lights. Uh, but it, it can also represent vitality, love, and warmth. And then the autumn red speaks to me as being this last explosion of life before winter sleep. It kickstarts the whole process of, you know, and just the preview of the show the trees will put on a few weeks time, you know, once they feel like it. It's just, it's nice. I really enjoy it. Then I learned that the mist flower is currently in bloom. It's a pale bluish purple. It provides a bit of nectar for butterflies, skippers, and bees. And I'd like to incorporate this into my garden next year. I like to extend the flower bed's appeal throughout the year as much as I can. And uh, this is a native plant, so it shouldn't be too fussy to keep alive. And it'll attract butterflies and bees, which is all very good. And the pictures I've seen of this flower make me think of a mist, which is very pleasing for autumn because we do tend to start getting more mist and fog. And as that happens, Happens, the energy gets more spooky and it's all very happy. Uh, so I am on the hunt. Hopefully I will be able to work this flower into my garden in the not too distant future. Uh, lastly, the website mentioned that we're likely to see bald birds, including cardinals, which the picture they had of it, that poor cardinal was so, so pitiful looking. Uh, apparently they are molting right now and the poor deers have just gotten rather thin on top. I mean, they they actually look sad, the pictures I've seen of them. So I do feel bad for the birds. Uh, but from what I understand, this is a necessary process to help prepare the birds for winter. I haven't seen this yet, but I am looking for it. And if possible, I will uh, snag a picture if I happen to see a bald bird, if I'm you know, on, on my porch or if I'm out taking a walk. And it just feels like another gentle push to make sure that the preparations for cold weather are all in order. Now it's still in the mid eighties in Missouri, but it's not unheard of a, for us to go from 80 degrees to 40 degrees within a space of a couple days. So it's important to be prepared for all eventualities because you don't know when the weather's going to turn or how many times it will switch back and forth. I've also been investigating local traditional celebrations, especially since people seem to have mostly recovered from the fit of the vapors they had about COVID, and they are starting to resume normal activities. Later on this month, there's a number of festivals that will revolve around the ripening apples, and these festivals are just scattered all over the state. I don't know if my husband and I will end up having time to take a little day trip to attend any of these, but I just, I love the idea of it. So if I can't go to these festivals, I will have to have a bit of a celebration at home. My husband's favorite kind of uh, pie is apple, and I'd say he's overdue for a treat, so I'll make him one of those. And I'd also like to try my hand at making homemade cider. 
and possibly homemade apple butter. It depends on how many apples I can persuade my husband to get for me. My great aunt Fiera actually made her own apple butter and she was rather good at it. And I, I think it would make her smile if she knew that I was following in her footsteps. And also the local farmer's market is getting quite busy. Uh, this is the best time of year for it. There's an abundance of things at each booth. People are bringing in not just their plants and their veggies and their fruits, but they're also bringing their baked goods and their crafts, all kinds of homemade stuff. And it's within walking distance of where I currently live. So it's a fun way to start off the weekend. And in my own garden, I'm afraid things are looking a bit dubious. Uh, the cucumber plant did not manage to produce cucumbers of any significant size. And they never really got that nice dark green color that you think of when you think cucumbers. It's like they got a teensy tiny bit of green and then they went instantly yellow and, and rotted on the vine. So that made me sad. Uh, but my husband and I do have a few ideas about how to manage that next year and hopefully we'll have better luck. Now the tomatoes, my gothy black Russians, they are still growing and they look healthy as far as I can tell. I am impatiently waiting for them to ripen. So we'll have to see how that goes. I do think they would benefit from getting more sunlight. So they definitely get a different spot uh, next year for sure. My bell pepper plant and the habanero pepper plant are finally getting blooms. And I hope we do have something to harvest before frost comes. So fingers crossed. Uh, but the marigolds I planted, they are extremely cheerful this year. Strong bloomers, bright yellow and orange. They're just growing like champs. My lavender plant has yet to bloom. I'm going to repot it in a few weeks and I'm going to try to keep it alive through the winter. And I'll be doing the same thing with my purple leafy vine thing. I can't remember what it's called, but it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, while the odds aren't exactly in my favor, if I can just nurse it along until next spring, then maybe it can uh, keep getting transplanted into bigger, bigger pots and be this permanent indoor, outdoor plant that I can just keep around, hopefully for years to come. We'll see. Now, spiritually, all of this leaves me in a state of tying up loose ends and uh, getting ready to flow with the changes that the season is going to bring. And I also feel a sense of peace and it being at rest. And even though I'm busily preparing things for next year, I, I have a sense of accomplishment and it feels really good. I adopted a custom I learned about on uh, Freya Norling's uh, YouTube channel. On the 1st of September, I took my kitchen scissors. I went outside. I cut an X on the ground. I filled it in with an offering of water while uh, praising Freya and asking for his blessings for the harvest. I also petitioned the goddess uh, Freya, the goddess Sif, and the god Thor for the same thing uh, because they're all connected to the agricultural cycles. And then, as is my custom, I put my autumn decorations around the house, which has brightened everything up to no end. Uh, this, of course, celebrates the arrival of fall and the uh, autumn equinox. Uh, the equinox, with equal measures of night and day, has me examining whether or not my life is in balance and what to do about areas that require more work. So to begin with... One thing to create greater balance is increasing my ties to the land where I live. I just flat out shouldn't know more about the land history and customs of places overseas than I do about the place where I was born. Uh, by what right do I ignore the spirits of this land, all of its history, and devote my energies to learn about spirits and lands that I may never set foot on? So that imbalance is getting addressed. It's also time to put to bed some of the feelings and insecurities I've experienced about becoming middle-aged. I'm in my 40s now, the autumn of life. And autumn is my favorite season, so I should make this a wonderful chapter. Uh, one of the goings on challenges of, uh, in a woman's life is gaining mastery over emotion. Uh, we need to rule our chaos, chaos, not be ruled by our chaos. And I'm of an age where there's really no excuse not to have gotten a handle on this. It's unbecoming, it gets in the way of gaining greater wisdom and maturity. So I am making a choice to not indulge in those old thought patterns and to interrupt my brain with new thoughts when it starts getting off track. Sometimes you do have to force a little bit of change on yourself. And the other thing that I believe will create greater balance in my life, in general, but also spiritually, is fully embracing the exploration of Norse spirituality that Loki has led me to. I haven't been asked to give up on the spiritual structure and routine of Wicca, but by focusing on the Norse gods and the gods who are they are the gods of my ancestors on both sides of my family and incorporating aspects of that into my existing practice seems to be what I need. Uh, this was the missing root in my life. And now that root has been transplanted into Missouri. So it'll be interesting to see how that grows.
And uh, that's what I've got going on this week. I think next week this series will focus on a singular topic, but I'm not over planning things. I don't have a master plan for the entire month of September. I'm allowing this particular series to naturally evolve and we'll see what happens. So I hope you will be back to find out. In the meantime, uh, share any of your thoughts and impressions and your own uh, efforts to get more rooted in your own uh, locality uh, with me in the comment section below or come see us on Gilded. There's a link to join us in the description box and you just click on it. It will take you to us and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you there. So hope to see you soon and uh, well, that's it for now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>